Uh, some of you have, uh, I know, traveled a long way to come to this uh, conference. Uh, uh, that I think it's the second time in the Southern Hemisphere. So, very nice to, to have you here. So, I have some uh, practical announcement. My name is Arnaldo, one of the organizers, if you already don't know. Um, so, we have uh, some last minute changes to our uh, schedule. So, uh, if you look at the printed version, mainly the, uh, if you're a speaker, uh, we have to change because, you know, we can't trust, uh, at least we learn we can't trust the flight company. Some of our speakers ar arrive one day after they are supposed to, <laughs> so we won't, don't, didn't want to make them uh, make a speech just coming from the airport. So, but, um, so just look at that. Um, Probably you know, but for the coffee break, which is very important, uh, you had to go out of the building around to the gymnasium uh, back. So just go out outside uh, around, and we have also the uh, poster session there. Uh, for those uh, that hang up their posters, uh, they are numbered uh, one to whatever, so it's sequ sequential. And uh, it's so that uh, even numbers present one day and uh, all, uh, uh, odd numbers in the other one. Um, so just uh, you can just leave your poster during the whole uh, conference. I think it's nice. So if you uh, get to talk to someone about uh, your work, then you just go there and uh, it's hang out there. Um, don't um, forget to um, uh, make pay a visit to our um, sponsors. They were very important, uh, of course, to um, sustain economically this uh, conference. Um, we have, uh, I think, four, four sponsors, and uh, in a fifth one that is uh, on the, just um, uh, uh, supporting uh, on a distance. They. Uh, I think I, I talked to them, some of them, they stay, some stay until Wednesday. So if you want to pay a visit, just do that before um, that day. So they will be glad to, to uh, welcome you there. Anything else? Okay, uh, just a, a quick announcement about the welcome cocktail and visit to the series today. So the welcome cocktail will be at the Sirius site just after the visit. So if you want to join, everybody is welcome, whether you registered before or not. There will be buses leaving here at 3.30 after the coffee break. So it just, everybody is welcome to join us. Okay, let's uh, give uh, to the Sirius part of the <laughs> business. Exactly, I, I'm the Sirius part. So, um, it's a pleasure for me to um, welcome and introduce Harry Westphal Jr. Um, he, closer? Like this, okay. So, Harry is a child of the University of Campinas. So, he studied over here and made a very, how should I say, vertical uh, career, scientific career. He's a deputy scientific director of... Um, of the Campina synchrotron from 2011 to 2012. Then he became the LN LS scientific director from 2013 to 2019. And he's now the general director, if I understood it correctly, from 2020. Harry is interested in magnetism, in soft matter materials, and in particular, in synchrotron radiation instrumentation and has dedicated his scientific life to this and I hope we will now have here, I'm convinced, a, a very nice overview of all these accomplishments. You will. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you, Simona, for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you for the organizers for these uh, great opportunities to show you what's been going on in the Brazilian synchrotron. And um, 
And also thank you for, for listening. And most of all, thank my colleagues for providing and for doing all the work and providing all the information for this presentation. So it's a great honor and pleasure for me to be here, as Simona said. I'm, uh, I was born and raised in the University of Campinas, the best university in the country. Uh, and uh, so I did my undergrad and PhD here. Uh, then after that, I moved to U.S. for a few years and returned for the Synchrotron Lab. So uh, all the things that I'm going to show you uh, are <coughs> done today and are administrated by the center, uh, by the Brazilian Center for Research in Energy and Materials. And uh, this is a, a non-profit private organization uh, that uh, is supervised by the Ministry of Brazilian Ministry of Science and Technology. So we have a contract with the Brazilian Science and Technology Ministry. And it's a multi-user facility, also does R&D. Uh, we also have courses uh, and uh, an undergrad school as well now. And uh, our own uh, research. So the uh, center was originated in the synchrotron. So it was the first, uh, the center was created for the synchrotron. Um, and uh, we ran a second generation facility uh, synchrotron for... Uh, from 1987 to 2019, and basically that's where the synchrotron, Brazilian synchrotron community uh, has arisen. And now we are moving to Sirius, but in the center also we have other four laboratories, um, the Biosciences Laboratory, uh, Biorenewables Laboratory, and also a Nanoscience and Nanotechnology Facility, and more recently a uh, school, uh, an undergrad course on, on a Bachelor Degree of Sciences. So, but I'm going to talk only about the synchrotron today. So, overall, we have uh, uh, tens of facilities running around the world, and uh, three of them are now what we call fourth generation, based on the multi-band acromat technology. Uh, the first one was MAX-4, that had the first beam in 2016, and came ESRF, EBS, and Sirius, in about uh, 2000, the end of 2019. Uh, all these facilities, they, they use this multi-band achromatic technology that we now call the fourth generation of storage ring light sources. Uh, as a project goal, Sirius uh, was aimed at optimizing first coherence. So to have the ultimate machine for coherence, which means not only accelerators with high brilliance, but also high stability on the electron beams, high stability on the optics, high speed detectors and processing. Uh, but also, we, um, in the uh, optimal goals of the project, we should have high brilliance hard X-rays as well for spectroscopy and imaging, and as well keeping the low energy side of the program as I think is the only fourth generation machine now keeping uh, infrared and ultraviolet uh, beam lines. So, some facts about this, for this project is a greenfield facility constructed, uh, the construction of this building started in early 2015. Uh, the total cost, including personnel, uh, building, beam lines, 14 beam lines, and accelerators, and electricity bill, everything, was about $500 million over the last uh, 11 years. 85% spent here in Brazil. I'll say some words about this. We, uh, in this first phase, we have 14 beam lines. Six of them are in regular user operation. Uh, four in commissioning, and four in construction. You'll have a chance to see them this afternoon. We are running at 100 milliamp to pop mode and a uniform fill. Uh, for the phase one, that's where we're going to stay. <clears throat> and the first uh, regular user call was November 2022. And uh, we're now about more than 4,000 hours for this year <clears throat> on, uh, for uh, beam time for experiments. Now, <clears throat> going back to the same, uh, the, some concepts on coherence and how do you optimize coherence in these machines, Basically, we have to remember that when we have the beam from undulators, uh, it's only a fraction of this green part of the beam that is what we call the coherent fraction. And the goal is to optimize, to make it as large as possible, this fraction. Now, this depends on the size and divergence of the effective beam, which is a convolution of the electron divergence in size with the photon divergence in size. So the best way of optimizing this convolution is matching the emittance to the wavelength of the source, uh, which if we look at the emittance of a photon is basically 200 picometers divided by the energy in kilo electron volts. So uh, in the range of one kilo electron volts, 200 picometers is what we call the fraction limit. Um, and also optimizing 
what we call the beta function, which is essentially the um, Rayleigh length of the electrons, thinking about them as optics, uh, with the undulator size, which is also the Rayleigh length of this, uh, this source, uh, which runs about one to four meters. So the optimal condition is not only to have a small uh, emittance, but also to match the phase space. When more technically matching the phase space, when we look at the phase space of photons, so take two machines with the same emittance, and we look at the emittance of the phase space, so this is divergence, uh, and the angular and, and uh, positional in the phase space of the photons. This is one 2D slice in a six-dimensional uh, phase space. But when we look at the phase space of the photons and convolute uh, two different sources with the same emittance but two different beta functions, one at what, what we call the 1.5 meters of Sirius, we see that the, uh, uh, the effective brilliance or the effective phase space is much closer to the photon phase space than if we had the same emittance but a large dispersion on the beta on the, 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 in, on the divergence. So that results in almost twice the brilliance even though they have the same emittance. So the key is matching phase space. So with that, uh, there was a design for this fourth generation machine. Uh, the, this, uh, it was the, it, I'm sorry, let me just uh, take my time here. Um, this is a five band acromat design. So it's uh, with um, these low field dipoles, four low field dipoles and uh, one high field dipole. The booster of this machine is inside the tunnel. So it has, uh, its uh, circumference is about 520 meters. It's a 20 uh, section of five band acromat. Uh, the design is to run at 350 milliamp. As I said, we are going to uh, upgrade that in the future. Um, and uh, we work at the 500 megahertz and an emittance of 250 picometers in the bare machine. Of course, as we have more insertion devices, this emittance is supposed to reduce. Uh, in the high beta section, so this 20 uh, section of the machine is five, has a five-fold symmetry. Most of its sections is a low beta section, which means the beam in the center of the section is about 18 micrometers by 2 micrometers. Uh, we have a few high beta sections, um, one of them uh, mostly uh, for, uh, used for injection. And the low beta, and the, um, the smallest beam is inside the, the uh, super bands. These are 3.2 Tesla bending magnets. And they, can be they are used for the high energy beam lines, the low beta for the high brilliance, and the low field dipoles for infrared and ultraviolet beam lines, as I'm going to show. So the five-fold symmetry of the optics option not only gives us 15 low beta or high brilliance, high coherence sections for beam lines because of the better matching between the photon beam space and the space, uh, phase space of the undulators, but also allows a small gap undulators and it's easier for operation because it allows a better, more stable operation as I'm going to show you. The project timeline. Uh, this, uh, we count basically the, the ideas of Sirius, they started the much earlier, uh, of having a new light source, about 2006. But it was in 2012, by this uh, MAC meeting in June 18, that uh, the, uh, the MAC meeting had a, uh, a challenge for our accelerator physics to change the third generation design of the machine to a fourth generation, which they attended, and the turning point was to become the, a new project with a fourth generation with a five-band uh, five acromat lattice. By the October 2014, the land was ready to start construction and to, uh, uh, Jan January 2015 was when we started. Then there was a construction period for the facility and by May 2018, LINAC was installed. By October 18, the building was ready for installation. So we started assembling uh, this, uh, this storage ring and in vacuum components. And by November 2019, we had the first turn and also the first image on a bricolage of a, of a kind of a tomography beam line. Um, then uh, came COVID uh, and we had to slow down our installation of the beam lines. But we managed to, uh, to have shifts for different groups and uh, still continue the construction and by July 2020, we had the first experiment uh, on SARS-CoV virus. And uh, that was the only kind of research allowed in the facility at that point, and we had only one beam line. But by October 2021, we had six beam lines starting commissioning. So, and uh, in November 21, uh, we started to having the 100 milliamps 
current, our first culprit for proposals, and more recently started running in top up at 100 milliamps. So that's essentially the timeline over the last, uh, let's say, 10 years. Uh, this is a small video of the facility. Uh, we, unfortunately, I don't think we will be able to visit the tunnel, all of us, uh, but those who want to see, this is the uh, LINAC uh, injecting into the booster, which is in the right side of the screen, and the storage ring in the left side. And um, it's an important fact, as we mentioned, all the magnets for this facility, the, the, the electromagnets, they were done in a collaboration uh, with a Brazilian company for motors and generators. So this is a Brazilian development for the, uh, for the accelerator. Uh, and um, and you, as you see, many other developments for beam lines and all the vacuum components and, uh, and um, electronics. So now uh, let me see about, tell you something about the performance of the electron beam in, in this accelerator. So what you see here is the power spectral density of the electron beam in different uh, options. So more, very recently we started operation uh, with the first order feedback system. And you can see here, <coughs> this is, these are spectral, uh, the noise spectral for uh, the system without, um, for instance, blue without the fast orbit feedback. Then we had recent optimization uh, on the tunes for the synchronous storage ring. And with the fast order feedback, the green curve, we have uh, over obviously an attenuation of all the noise. And this is the crossover frequency is where these fast orbit feedback systems start to not be so uh, uh, effective, but at 400 hertz, this is uh, one of the largest crossover frequencies. So it means that all, all the way up to 400 hertz, that's what we are attenuating. So in a sense, this results in a very stable synchrotron beam, probably the most stable. We can see all the same token uh, looking at the system before the fast orbit feedback, after the tuning optimization, and the green is the resultant RMS of, uh, of, of the beam position across the storage ring. If we zoom in in that position, that's what we got. So it's about 1% um, fluctuation, uh, about 1% of the size of the beam in the horizontal direction, and about 4% of the vertical size of the beam. If we look in numbers, this represents about 100 nanometers of stability on the centroid of the beam. So that's as much as, as the uh, state-of-the-art resolution for the beam positioning monitors. So that also comes a very interesting message that as we upgrade, and there are many machines coming now uh, for the future of fourth generation, like APS is probably going, APSU is probably going to be the next one. But for all the machines coming, this stability is going not only the emitters, but having your beam stable within these boundaries is crucial for the experiments and is crucial for coherence applications. You need a very stable source. Now. And stability also means current stability. This is how we are operating now, 100 milliamps. So 100 milliamps, and this is a fluctuation of 0.3 milliamps. We have one pulse injected every three minutes in a uniform filling of 864 bunches. And uh, this is a transparent injection, which means doing this every three minutes injection, the users in the beam lines don't feel this injection point. And this is also true for the infrared beam line, which is crucial in terms of stability. What you see here is also before and after all this, uh, uh, the fast orbit feedback and the tuning. So you see here, this is a, a green curve for before these optimizations. During the injection, what you see here is basically the horizontal and vertical position of the beam bumping on during the injection. As we made all these upgrades, we now get a, a disturbance of 7% of the beam and 22% of the beam during this injection period, which is a few milliseconds. So that's what we call a transparent injection. Now, in terms of hours that we use this facility, basically in 2020, uh, I'm so, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, this is, this is um, uh, switched. It's 2023, we have 4,152 hours for operation. Basically, that's how we divide nowadays the operation of the facility. We have part of the beam time dedicated, well, the tunnel has to be open for installing the new devices, new insertion devices, new front ends. We have machine studies that we have 15, typically 15% 15 of all the beam available, and we are going to keep this. It's important to keep research on the beam. No activity basically means Sundays. We are not operating on Sundays and some holidays, and almost half of the beam time for users. And now I come to the part where I show some of the results from the beam lines. 
So these are the, the basically the 14 beam lines. We have six of them in uh, operation. And uh, I'm going to show some results of the users, user commissioning. So most of the results I'm going to show, they happened last year. Uh, they will come from measurements last year, which was user commissioning mode. This year is already regular operation. We haven't seen so many publications yet. These are going on, the measurements. And I'm going to show also some results of uh, beam lines in, um, that are in, in commissioning. I'm not going to show the assembly of this, uh, some of these beam lines. You're going to have opportunity to see. But for the first cycle of proposals, we, have about, we had about in the, for the first semester, so this current semester is ending, we had 300, about 225 submitted proposals, 125 approved for five beam lines. I don't count the protein crystallography beam line, which was the first to operate, and is on fast track, so it didn't open and enter in this call. But essentially, you see a, an average of three to one, and some beam lines, like the extreme condition, is a higher uh, competition rate. Uh, and I'm going to show some results of these beam lines. But we also have four beam lines in commissioning. And I'm going to quickly show some results of the commissioning on these beam lines. And other four beam lines two, uh, in installation, two of them in an advanced stage of installation. They are supposed to start oper uh, or first beam in this year yet. And other two that last year we had to stop them, especially uh, this PDF beam line in high energy and the low energy ARPES beam line in UV. Uh, basically, it was a management decision for uh, maintaining the salaries. As you know, Brazil uh, we went to a large turmoil last year, and uh, we had to face the facts and stop some of the construction so we could pay the salaries. As I said, we are a private facility, so we don't have salaries granted in, 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 our, in, in our contract, so we still have to pay from the same budget. And it was a wise decision because just now we received a new installment of payment, so more than a year late after the last installment of payment. But that paid off, and now we are going to be able to finish these two beam lines. As of Friday, we received the news that we first got our first money in our account. So from the protein crystallography beam line, I'm gone, not going to say much, except that it's, it's starting the high impact publications are starting to show up, like the science paper, uh, a recent nature communication, and the beam line, as I said, is working in a in a fast track mode. More recently, we had users from small molecules. We had a group of users testing and commissioning the use of this protein crystallography for small molecule diffraction. It was highly successful. And now we also start operating the protein crystallography beam line for the small molecule community in the same fast track system. Uh, this, all these beam lines, they cover this uh, energy range. So this is unique for a fourth generation synchrotron that we cover from the infrared all the way to hard X-rays. So starting from Imbuya, our uh, infrared beam line, UV beam line, two UV beam line, one dedicated to circular dichroism and one dedicated to uh, uh, angle result photo emission, two soft X-ray beam lines. Most of our other beam lines, they range from the tender to the hard X-rays, and two beam lines that don't cover the entire energy range that I put here, but only some energies, they are based on multi-layers. This one is in commissioning, the last one, Jatoba, is still a, a, one of the beam lines that was stopped but we, we will continue construction now. Our proposal review system, also we decided to implement a new proposal review system this, uh, in this call, which means that um, every proponent in the proposal call is a reviewer. So as a proponent, you have to review about five to six proposals, uh, preferentially in your area. Obviously, this is not possible because there are a vast number of areas, but we ask you to evaluate in a double blind system only the science in the, this five, six proposals. All these reviews are gathered together and we have a committee that evaluates the evaluations. So this committee is uh, physics and engineering, chemistry, environmental science and, and biology. Basically, they got together for two days and they look all the evaluations, they remove the outliers, and from that we get the best ranked proposals all in a, du a double blind system until we basically um, uh, do the technical evaluation and safety evaluation and schedule the proposals. That's how it worked in the first semester, and that's how it worked in the second call now that we just finished. We are about to publish the results for the second call. Now, going into the beam lines. Uh, Karnaúba beam line is uh, one of our flagship beam lines. It's, that it is a nanoprobe that works in the tender X-ray regime. Some of the specs of this beam line, it's still uh, it's two, uh, two, 2 kV to 15 kV. We're still not reaching the smallest energy because uh, we um, 
had some issues with undulators for these beam lines, which has been solved already. But uh, we had to make decisions in the early days of the project. Either we start uh, with uh, commissioning undulators or we don't start. So we decided to start with smaller, cheaper undulators that could bring us up to speed and start commissioning. So that's what we did, and I think it was successful. Now, the energy resolution of this beam line is about the is a four crystal monochromator, so it's, it's about the Darwin width of the monochromator. It has all achromatic uh, focusing, so you can do scattering, you can do the fraction, you can do um, uh, spectroscopy, all in a, uh, with a fixed beam position. Uh, you can work with a multi, uh, multi technique, and uh, it has two end stations. The first one is a sub-micron to 100 nanometer end station. That's the first one operating. You see a picture here, and I, I hope you have a chance to visit this beam line. The second one is implementing. Uh, we are implementing now. It's, uh, it's supposed to run down to 30 nanometers of focus. So it's a very challenging beam line with uh, positioning systems with stability of one nanometer. That's what we aim to do, one nanometer resolved uh, scanning probe imaging. And um, uh, that's... Um, one of the probes that we did now in the beam line, so it, it helped us to probe not only the beam line stability, but also the storage ring, how it was stable and how the emittance was. So we basically reached uh, within the one bit criteria to 12 nanometers on tychography on this Zeeman star, which says that, uh, okay, all the system working together, uh, convoluted, they are within the limits of what we expect for, for the resolution of this machine. And a nice example of a user, a commissioning user publication was this uh, uh, advanced energy materials. So basically, uh, is an investigation of water splitting by using these oxidases. So they did zanes on oxidases in one of these in situ electrochemical uh, cells uh, using um, uh, um, spectroscopy techniques. And what you can see here is one of these lamps of proteins. They ran the zanes on these lamps, and uh, basically they probed the oxidation state of copper within this protein and correlated to the local potential to understand. This is not only useful to understanding water splitting of, of these molecules, but also it, it became an, uh, an interesting technique to be applied to other systems. Very nice publication. Now, going into the Caterete beam line, I didn't mention, but all these beam lines, they are named after trees or animals of the Brazilian biodiversity, and they are also acronyms for the techniques. Some of them are better than are worse. I'm only going to cite the better, best ones, like Caterete is coherent and time-resolved scattering. Uh, that worked. Not all of them work this way, but um, okay, this beam line has also a very similar uh, uh, monochromization system to the Carnauba beam line. It's also for crystal monochromator. All the focusing optics is side bounce. We actually magnify the source into the sample. So to create a round 40 micron beam of fully coherent uh, plane wave uh, with a, a focused uh, beam of uh, focal depth of several meters. So with that, we can run uh, the, the uh, is a small angle uh, scattering uh, beam line. So the detector can go from one meter all the way to 30 meters. This is another development uh, that we did with Brazilian companies based on the, sh uh, the ship from CERN, the Medipix, we are part of this consortium. We developed large area detectors. This one, for instance, is 144 ships of Medipix detector. And uh, it's all integrated and done here in Brazil by this company, PyTech. So it's a 10 megapixel detector. And the Q range of this beam line can go all the way from 10 to the minus 3 to the 30 nanometers minus 1. Basically, we dedicate the beam line to tychography. Plane wave CDI, which is challenging, but I'm going to show you one example, and XPCS. This is one example of wide field of view tachography. So this is a, 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 porous, a, it's a polymer membrane for filtration. So what you see here is an image, a tachography, three-dimensional tachography image of a large field of view. So you see this 10 microns. This is a large sample done with coherent scattering at 25 nanometer resolution. And this is the plane wave CDI done in, in, a, in, a, in a logo that we printed. But basically, the interesting point here is that while this is a scanning technique, this is a fulfilled. So a single shot, 3D rotation, gather all the reciprocal space information and converge to this 3D image. That was the design of the beam line. That's, it, it's working, but it's very challenging yet for soft samples, for less contrasting samples. That's, that's something that we are tackling now. The same beam line can do also X-ray for photon correlation spectroscopy. And what you see here 
is by basically hydrogels uh, and the uh, cross-linking systems. Uh, the the cross-linking from different hydrogels changes the dynamics of the, the of these hydrogels, and you can nicely see from XPCS the exponent going from different diffusive superdiffusive regimes. Uh, so basic science of XPCS served as commissioning, but it's also it's uh, now a user uh, a proposal, uh, accepting proposals for users in this, in this technique as well on the beamline. So, so much for Caterete and, and Carnauba. Uh, now the stream condition beamline. Basically, uh, it works with a double crystal monochromator, high stability double crystal monochromator. I'm going to mention something about it. It has uh, similar energy resolution, uh, but I think the high, major uh, uh, flagship of this beamline is this, that it can work with very high pressures, low and high temperatures, and high magnetic fields. So the beamline was designed to work up to 600 gigapascal. They are already achieving 300 gigapascal. Uh, temperatures uh, above 1 Kelvin and below 8,000 Kelvin. Right now, they are working with 3 Kelvin, above 3 Kelvin, and below 7,000, so close to the key performance parameter of the beamline. They installed recently the 11 Tesla um, uh, magnetic field system for XMCD, so it's working quite well. And uh, it can do also multiple techniques, X-ray diffraction, Zanes, XAFs, XMCD. It's probably going to be the first beamline in the world to do low temperature, high fields, high pressure, and diffraction all at, at once. Um, this is an example from also users that, uh, that did measurements during the user community. They basically studied uh, how the, uh, using diffraction under high pressure, they studied how the uh, lattice parameter for the systems work during doping and uh, under pressure. Sorry, and uh, they correlated the volume, uh, the pressure with the volume of um, the, the, um, the unit cell. And from that, they could extract a phase diagram from the critical temperature of, of these materials as a function of the volume of the unit cells and correlate hydrostatic pressure with uh, chemical pressure to understand the hypothesis that they work the same. Well, ongoing research, but basically showing that the beamline can do this kind of measurement. Um, going now to the inelastic X-ray scattering beamline. It's one of the last ones to be commissioned. Again, it's, uh, it's a soft X-ray beamline, resolving power of 60,000, about at, uh, at 930 EVs. Uh, it's not working with its full uh, uh, photon flux. Again, we are working with a small undulator yet for commissioning. And the beam size and the sample position, it's for the RIG system, is one to three, uh, by three microns, four to five at the XPS. RIG's resolution is supposed to achieve better than 50 millielectron volts. Right now, we are at 120 millielectron volts, ready for, uh, for, user, uh, for users to use the beamline. And it can do liquid, polycrystal, monocrystal in different modes. These are very recent results that I, I got from the group of the beamline. So they used a multi-layer system to probe the resolution. So you can see here is a two-pixel resolution on the XCAM CD, SCD, CCD. So showing that we can reach 120 millielectron volts. Uh, also uh, basically scanning sample position to see the optimal condition. And a very nice RIG spectrum uh, in this um, copper antimonide oxide uh, that show that, okay, this is ready to go uh, into user uh, mode as well. Now, last but not least, the infrared beamline. As I said, this is a tricky beamline to do in fourth generation synchrotrons, as you know, most of the uh, magnets are quite squeezing the vacuum chambers, and so it was a challenge to do infrared or UV beam lines in, in, in these synchrotrons. It, it, it will remain a challenge. But fortunately for, for, for our design and machine, we, we, we established in the early days of the project that we wanted to keep the low energy side of the spectrum in this fourth generation. So this was inserted in the, in, in the goals of the engineering project. And the infrared beam line, how it does now, it basically extracts the radiation from the, uh, the weak field dipoles on the, on, the, on the magnetic lattice. And we basically refocus on to do different end stations, one for uh, SNOM nanoprobe and one for a micro FTIR, very regular FTIR, right? The beam line can work uh, within this energy range and different energy resolution, depending if you're doing um, the SNOM or you're doing micro FTIR. The, uh, the, we can gather in, uh, five by five milli radians of radiation. That's the limit that the vacuum chambers allow us. But with that, we can reach about 10 to the 12 photons per second. And right now, we are, well, this, the, the, what we're going to show you is that 
the kind of spectrum, this is, uh, is one of these, the spectrometer for, for the um, SNOM technique. Yeah, we worked together with NIA SNOM for, for many years, from UVX to now. And this is a recent result using the broadband of the synchrotron to uh, look at the interface between these um, polymer blends. So you can look at the charge and the blend from different polymers, look at the spectral density and do some spectral points and where you can do FTIR with 25 nanometer resolution. Uh, that's the objective, so beating by far the diffraction limit of, a, of infrared. And showing, and the, this spectrum taken at 100 milliamps was already twice as better than what we had in UVX, thanks to the stability of the machine. So infrared is extremely sensitive to stability, and even though with this beamline now, we cannot gather as large apertures as we used to in the UVX, we're still getting better signal to noise than we used to do in that machine. Some results, how much time do we have? Okay, okay, so I'm, I'm doing well. So now I'm going to move to some results from commissioning. These four beam lines are open for user commissioning. Uh, so the first one is the uh, high energy tomography beam line. It works uh, in a cone beam geometry and a multi-layer system provides beams at 22, 39, and 68 kilo electron volts. These were the first users commissioning the beam line. Uh, they basically were studying uh, something that they could not study in Europe. So this is a group from uh, Southampton, uh, Tina Roos and Nancy Walker, was her, her student. And they were studying uh, uh, how um, Xylella fastidiosa is a bacteria well known here in, the, in South America that infect, infects plants and they infect the xylem of the plants. And uh, there is some ideas that some plants resist to this bacteria because on the, the diameter of the, the, the vases, the xylem on the plant. So they wanted to test this hypothesis. They knew very well the samples. So they brought the, the, to the beam line. And this is what you see, one of the examples of uh, the, this, these tubes. Basically, they are correlating the diameters so of quantitative information with the resistance of each one of the cultivars. Very interesting experiment. Couldn't be done in Europe, in fact. You needed a, a high energy tomography with high resolution like that. But also, you could not bring this kind of plant in, in Europe to the beam line because it's an infect is infectious disease for plants. Here is well adapted to our, uh, our biodiversity, but there it's been a nightmare to, create, to, to deal with this because it's infecting basically all the olives and grapes, and uh, it's still a big problem. So let's hope that they can shed, shed some light on this, on this problem. Now the beam line, uh, the zoom tomography, which basically is a cone beam that you can bring the sample and do a, a, a physical zoom, not a digital zoom. So it's optical zoom. This is what you see inside the Egypt head and body. And we can see basically the sample in a f far from the focal point. You have one zoom, pixel size of one micron. Any approach, you can reduce to 310 nanometers. Any approach, you can reduce to 150 nanometers, basically zooming in into the sample in 3D. Again, recent result on commissioning of this beamline. And that's one of the main uh, goals of this beamline, doing, being able to do this multi-length scale tomography. Uh, powder diffraction the beamline, <clears throat> this is also a beamline in commissioning. It's uh, been doing, uh, basically, uh, the beamline was designed to do high throughput and high resolution X-ray diffraction in powdered samples. So what you see here is this high resolution the, uh, the, uh, diffractometer and the low resolution high speed error detector. So from the high resolution, we have already results, and so we are opening for user commissioning, bringing users. Uh, they probe the uh, lanthanum exaborite, and they reach basically the limit, and they can see the limits of uh, resolution on the fraction for the instrument. Very interesting. It's still not working at full efficient of the detector, but enough to start user commissioning. Also, the insertion device on this beamline, we're still using a, an old wiggler until we have the vacuum undulators that we ordered this year, and they will arrive early ne next year. But it's enough, as I said, for, for installing the beamline and starting commissioning. This is, again, a development of, uh, for the high throughput diffraction is a development with the same Brazilian uh, company. So essentially, it's an area detector in an arch geometry. So what you see here, looking inside, if you can see, there are some uh, um, area detector uh, chips that are installed in a staggered way so that we can, win, uh, we can reduce some of the gaps. And uh, this staggering basically can see the diffraction patterns. And from these diffraction patterns, then we can basically deduce the full diffraction pattern. That's what's going on. 
uh, this kind of detector works at, at two kilohertz uh, of frame rate, so it's for high throughput, high speed measurements, complementary to the high resolution. Uh, the soft X-ray beam line dedicated to XMCD and uh, photo emission electron microscopy. Uh, it's also had the first image a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month. But it's an artificial spin ice uh, from a permalloy of nano islands provided by here, by the Physics Institute at Unicamp. So what you see here is a, basically a 15 by 15 micrometer square with these hexagons. Uh, they have an interesting um, ma ma magnetic properties. That's not exactly the, the core of the talk now, but it was to see that th this instrument, all the light is shining into the weight of the end of the beam line, and we can see uh, measure a sample. They're still in early stages of technical commission, but it seems to be very successful. By the, uh, actually, by the end of this year, we are going to install the first um, uh, um, delta undulator for this beam line. That was one of the developments that we did for undulators that took much longer than we expected, but now seems to come, be coming to an end. Uh, the same kind of extraction that we use for infrared, we can also extract for, uh, for ultraviolet. So this is a beam line dedicated to circular dichroism. As you see now, the synchrotron beam coming from this way. So basically the same, a, uh, the same design as the infrared beam line, but dedicated to UV. So this first end station for the beam line is basically circular dichroism dedicated to the um, biophysics community, but you, there's a second end station that can be uh, dedicated later for different science. But basically, a couple of weeks ago also, we had the first beam coming on the viewport. Now, uh, I, I, I'm approaching the end. It's not only the beam line. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to skip these beam lines in installation, but you'll have a chance to see them uh, from your own eyes. There are also, we, we decided with the project not only to install beamline, but also to install support laboratories for sample preparation. So what I'm going to show now are not the labs, but some of the results of the, 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 these labs on sample preparation. Just a few highlights. So this is a, a, a dual FIB system, uh, basically a, a focused ion beam uh, based on xenon. And what you see here is, is a pillar being cut, removed from the sample, and installed in the carping for the um, for the uh, measurement and the tomography, such that you can cut micrometer samples for doing nanometer resolved tomography you, you, in this lab. So it's part of the user uh, available labs. Um, this is a preparation lab for cryogenic samples. This is a cryogenic slicing of a 10 micrometer slicing of a human uh, breast. Um, a laboratory for preparation of environmental samples. But a big part of a, our scientific program for the user community is environmental science. So this is what you see is a controlled chamber for, these are some beams that um, uh, were grown in this chamber and are kept there, not for, for eating purposes. We like a lot beam, but, but this is what's basically to bring to the beam lines. And the laboratory for extreme conditions, so they can pre prepare these uh, toroidal diamonds. Also, few places in the world can do this. And we have this kind of lab available for, for preparing uh, diamond anvil cells for, for, for the users. Uh, a few highlights on instrumentation. So this, was, uh, this is probably our flagship project for instrumentation, is the high dynamic uh, uh, double crystal monochromator. Is one, this was the first mechatronic advanced project that we decided to do in the synchrotron, basically because we needed to reach nanometer, uh, nanoradian resolution, so that we wouldn't spoil the source position, again, for coherence and for all the purposes. What matters is that not only you have a, a small source, but the source cannot be moving, either real or virtual move. So the parallelism in between crystal creates this virtual source movement, which is totally detrimental for the sample, for the measurements. So we invested a lot in a new concept of monochromator. So this, this for those not used to the regular monochromator, this beast here is, is a, a double crystal monochromator. Uh, what you, unfortunately this is not, oh yeah. So basically the design was to reach, being able to reach with this monochromator, this parallelism, not only in static, but also doing energy scans, for fly scans, synchronizing monochromator and undulator. And what you see now is the, the result of this monochromator doing uh, this absorption uh, spectra in, at one kilo electron volt per second. This is superposition of different fly scans showing the robustness of this monochromator, which was based on a completely different design. So we've, it's the first monochromator to use um, inter laser interferometry to, uh, 
uh, as a measure for this nano radian stability. We use actuators that are uh, uh, these Lorentz actuators, these voice coils, and we don't use guides, but we use lift springs. So it was a completely changing, reshaping on the, 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 the concept of a monochromator, and that leads to this ultra high stability. And uh, just a couple of hours before coming here, we were, all, all of our colleagues were attending the uh, PhD defense of our colleague, Renan Geralds, the engineer responsible for this project which also combined this project with a PhD and the Technique University of Eindhoven and, and was granted just a couple of hours ago. We're all very proud of it. Uh, as I said, detectors, we developed uh, a high line of detectors from small pixel, uh, uh, 512 pixel detector all the way to, to 10 megapixel detectors. These were all licensed to this company that is selling to us but also participating in other bids around the world. It's basically a hybrid pixel detector based on a Manipix chip. We are, we, you see many of them deployed in our beam lines. And uh, we're also now starting, uh, we entered in the time Manipix 4 collaboration for upgrades on these detectors. Um, cryo nanoprobe, this is a development for the Carnauba beam line where we expect to reach this one nanometer stability. What you see, some parts of the rotation stage and the sample delivery system in vacuum. So this is going to be a cryoprobe, completely redesigned as well, using the concepts that we learned from the monochromator. Uh, what you see here is, is how we uh, place the sample into the goniometer, but basically a, a carping delivery system. And sample environments, we developed lots of sample environments for uh, simulating rock fluid interactions in situ catalysis. You saw some of the examples of this. Uh, operando battery uh, and stream conditions and oils also soil microscopic processes that we can use uh, these sample stages where you can bring like the soil samples and the plants. All the, uh, the developments done in our project, they were licensed and they were in, in collaboration with Brazilian industry. So now we have an ecosystem of industries that can provide instrumentation for us and for universities. Um, so that such that most of our expenditures, they were done in the country itself. So that was important for not only for, for Texas purposes, but also for defending the project. Because once we started, this was a project not only from us, but from my entire community. This was thanks to a, a great integration between scientists, engineers, and all the team of LNLS that we are really proud to have working together. And um, I finished this by, by dedicating this, this talk to one of our engineer colleagues, João Leandro, who unfortunately was taken from us very abruptly a couple of weeks ago, and, but uh, whose lives he uh, inspired a lot. And the work also that he did impacted several ways, uh, the accelerator, the beam lines, all, everything that was done. So I dedicate this talk to him. And um, I finish just uh, giving a few words uh, about a new project of three new beam lines. We just uh, got, uh, an early uh, stage of funding. But these are going to be three beam lines connected to a biosafety laboratory, coupled to Sirius, so a BCL3 and 4, where we are going to have three beam lines working into this biosafety environment, uh, one for soft X-rays and dedicated to ex vivo um, cell tomography, one for ex vivo tissue tomography, and one for in vivo uh, animal tomography. Uh, for covering different aspects of how infectious diseases of pathogens that cannot be handled in regular laboratories uh, can be studied in such a lab with these three beam lines. And with that, please use this QR code to get more information from our synchrotron. I thank you all for uh, your attention, and uh, I would like to be available for your questions. Thank you very much. Okay, good. So thank you for this fantastic overview. Mark. Thank you so much for this uh, very nice results. It's very motivating the, 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 the community to, to visit uh, Sirius and to perform some measurements. I, I'm a bit surprised about 
uh, the, the choice of the beam lines because many, as you know, the Brazilian community in gas phase is very much recognized. A very large diversity, and I didn't, what, what are you, what is your project for such a kind of beam line? And particularly maybe on uh, axe space or soft x ways, uh, you didn't mention that, so please. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, in fact, um, as I mentioned, uh, doing low energy uh, this uh, UV science uh, on synchrotron on a fourth generation synchrotron is by far not trivial. In fact, we didn't even think that we could achieve um, energies below 100 electron volts with uh, the sources that we had until the point that we uh, figured ways of doing, because basically restrictions on how the insertion devices affect the stability of the machine. Uh, and um, so we started with uh, exploring this range with bending magnet radiation. Now, there are new developments going on where you can extend to uh, uh, undulators in the low energy range of, of the spectrum and uh, that can, are not so detrimental, especially for vacuum chambers and so on. Power load is, is a nightmare taking care of these machines. So going beyond this, this ultraviolet beam lines with the higher flux and high brilliance um, and selection of polarization and so on, we still had to rely on, um, let's say, novel insertion devices, and that was kind of a, a big lesson for us, to uh, wait until we have established synchrotron working until we can rely on such devices. And I think we are, for the phase two, we are already planning uh, beam lines in the gas phase, in the low energy size of the spectrum. And um, yeah, no, for hard x-rays, that there's no plan. But phase two is still an open page. We can, uh, we can still discuss that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for a nice presentation. I wonder a little bit about the shutdown you have on Sundays. Do you shut down the facility, I mean turning off the electron beam, or is it left open? And if so, can you sneak in on Sundays and keep doing your measurements, meaning that it's not a proper shutdown? Are we being recorded or? <laughs> well, so essentially working on Sundays, uh, there are restriction laws, of course, for the facility on how we can operate on Sunday. So officially we cannot operate uh, uh, and there's a cost for doing that that we might eventually uh, have to go through. So what we've been doing, we don't shut down the accelerator. Yeah? Uh, we keep it working on Sundays. And some students sometimes that don't have this labor law restrictions, they can come and use the beam lines. But it's not, uh, there's no support from employees from the lab. That's, that's one of the reasons we can Right now we cannot give this support on Sunday, so we don't consider official beam time. Uh, but we might have to. That's an operation budget issue that we haven't figured out yet. And uh, we still haven't established the operational budget. But I, I, I encourage the idea to have a day off because we are all people. So to be able to take a day off and say, Sunday is a family day, it's a good thing, I think. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Harry, for this uh, nice overview. Uh, Sirius is the first uh, diffraction limited synchrotron uh, in America, uh, in, on the continent, American continent. So uh, I would like to know uh, the origin of the users uh, at the facility uh, these days. Okay, thank you. Um, so for this first call, uh, we had about f uh, 15, of, let's say for this first year, about 15 to 20 percent, I don't remember the precise numbers, are from abroad. Most of them from Latin America, of these people that come from abroad. Um, but in the last call, we, uh, in these last two calls, we had proposals from everywhere in the world, from the United States, from Europe, from Asia, from everywhere. Most of the proposals yet come from Brazil. Some beam lines uh, are experiencing a higher demand from abroad, like uh, the extreme condition beam lines. We know that there are not so many like that in, in the world, and there's a large community in Brazil as well. So, um, yeah, and in, in Brazil, 
Uh, most of the users, they come from this south, uh, southeast region, close to Sao Paulo. It's still most of the proposals come from here. Um, second, northeast, uh, and then um, more or less distributed across the other regions of the country. So uh, this distribution within the country reflects more or less the distribution of number of scientists and that, that we have in the country. You're welcome. Hi, Harry. Uh, I have a question about the issue about um, the shortage, shortage of uh, liquid helium in the research. I know this is a very serious problem, not only for our synchrotron, but worldwide. How do you are dealing with this situation? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Thank you, Thank you Roger. Uh, we, are, we have developed a, a helium recovery system for the beamlines that was supposed to be start operation now in July. And uh, we decided that for the experiments that require liquid hearing, we, uh, we are postponing the operation until we have this helium recovery system ready. You see most of the parts are in place and we are working towards this, um, I think by September, if I'm not mistaken, Arcezo can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, by September, that's where we expect to be operating with the helium recovery system. And uh, th that's when we start to have these beamlines operating with liquid helium. But we are going to operate in fully in, in recovery. So your plan, your, your plan includes the supply of liquid helium continuously? You think? I, I'm, I'm sorry? So your planning for the next years is that you're going to have a continuous supply of uh, liquid helium for the, all the beamlines that need it? Yeah, well, well excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. That's very expensive experiments. They better be good. <laughs> hey. Thank you, Professor, for the presentation. Um, my question is more about uh, the lab, the specific lab that you have in the infrared, uh, for infrared energy, for infrared uh, wavelength. Uh, I think you show some results in, for biological experiments or biological uh, research, uh, but I don't know if you have, or Cyril have more uh, ideas for like communications, or have some projects about that? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I, I, I couldn't understand. Uh, I, sh I see that sh you show some of the parts uh, of your labs that you have some beams, isn't correct? And one of them is in the infrared uh, wavelengths or for yes. energy. So you show some biological experiments. So, some bi which experiments? Biological, yes. Biological, yes. But do you have some projects about in communications? Oh, for, you mean uh, research in communication? Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yes. Um, so the projects that, that happen in the beamline are from the user community mostly. So the examples I showed are basically from researchers, uh, and they, these beamlines are like the ones I showed. They are not dedicated to biology. They 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 cover a wide range of applications, and in fact, for if I can cite some of the, you asked about the infrared, so they, they, are do, they, they do work on the next generation of communication devices. Um, the researchers in the lab, they work at what is called nanophotonics. Uh, so they've been developing systems based on uh, um, plasmonic uh, uh, physics that correlate with, uh, with uh, communications and uh, information technology. Yeah. But it, uh, it's, I must say it's a vast, um, range of applications that you, you will find from the user community. What we provide are the synchrotron, the beamlines. Now the themes that they, the scientists choose, as long as they are in accordance to what the beamline can do, they, they, they can be varied. Further questions? If this is not the case, we would like to thank you again for this very nice talk. <laughs> And
and I would like to hand over to Tulio, who will explain more now. We have coffee break now, so the, uh, the, it's in the gymnasium, it's exactly in this direction here, it's just right above us, so we have to exit and go right and right again, and then we reach the coffee break. See you there. Thank you. It was very good.